Hey, welcome back to the Crowdfunding Demystified Podcast. I uh, haven't had an episode, I think, last week. I've um, just been a little bit behind, but that's actually because i got a ton of great stuff that is coming here, so make sure you stay tuned. But um, I wanted to kind of give you a great episode for today um, as it relates to launching a new project, and this is actually a community member. So if you're listening to this podcast right now, I'm always on the lookout for members of the Crowd Crux community who want to come on the show and kind of share their story, right? So if you have a success or you have something valuable that you can share with the community, I am all ears. So this guy actually, I didn't realize this uh, beforehand, but during the interview, we learned that he is one of my YouTube subscribers. So he has done a successful Kickstarter for what's called Tomb of Mystical Tattoos, a compendium of over 500 unique magical tattoos compatible with the fifth edition of Dungeons and Dragons. This Kickstarter campaign raised over $130,000, more than 5,000 backers, and he came on the show to reveal exactly how he did it. So this is kind of someone who's um, benefited from you know the the education I've put out, and he's been able to pull it together. Obviously, he's done incredible stuff, and um, it's so cool to me that he can come back and like share with the community what worked and what didn't for him, and be just super candid about where the funding came from. He did not start with a big community. He he had a Patreon with maybe like a hundred people. It was about three hundred dollars a month that was happening, but um, he ended up blowing this thing up, attracting five thousand backers on Kickstarter itself. Right, so, so this was like, to me, a great example of if you don't have a major crowd or major community or a big social media following, you can still knock it out of the park um, with a crowdfunding campaign. And you'll learn exactly on today's episode how he was able to do that. And some other news, um, I gave a recent webinar, a great recent talk with New York City um, when it came to starting a business, some great stuff there. Um, I've been just working super hard when it comes to writing new stuff for the blog, um, working on a new book, kind of in the planning stages there, working with my coaching students, um, a lot of great stuff, working on some different client projects as well. So I'm always, I'm always very busy. But if you want to get a little bit more up to date with me, some of the bite-sized content, some of the store, the updates that I do, um, just what's going on or stuff I'm working on, and you want to see some of the success stories, you can always follow me on Instagram. You can search my name, Salvador Brigman. My my, uh, my business Instagram will come up there. You can see all the bite-sized uh, podcasts that I'm producing. You can see the mini YouTube videos that I'm having done. They're literally like a minute long, right? And also I, I do some IGTV, so you can also get the longer format if you want to. The, the Instagram is a great source. I can't promise I'm always going to reply to the message there. Um, I have an assistant that can help me out a little bit getting to that. But um, if you want to also get my attention, I will include at the end of today's show um, a link where if you want to, you can book a one-on-one coaching call with me. And finally, a lot, a lot of other great stuff um, to, to be on the lookout for, I think, for this year in particular. But man, tabletop games, this category is just like destroying in a good way. Like it's, it's doing incredible. If you have a tabletop game project, I think it'd be a good time to launch as well as a physical product. I have some good episodes coming up um, in the hopper, which are going to be coming out uh, regularly from here on out. So excited for you guys. Um, can't wait for you to listen to this episode and it's coming up right after this. This podcast episode is sponsored by The Gadget Flow. The Gadget Flow reaches over 28 million people and they've been around since 2012. They are Indiegogo and Kickstarter experts. They featured over 5,000 crowdfunding campaigns. And if you have a technology or design campaign, it is a great platform to generate awareness and get backers. You can check them out at thegadgetflow.com slash submit and list your project today. Uh, awesome. It's uh, great to be here, Sal. Thanks for inviting me on. Definitely. Um, do you think we can get started? Maybe you can describe for the listeners a little bit about your product, who it's for, and just kind of the basics there. Yeah, so um, Tome of Mystical Tattoos is kind of uh, definitely a passion project. Um, I really love Dungeons and Dragons and just in terms of what it can do, uh, bringing people together, uh, allowing you to have fun in like this space that the Dungeon Master creates and kind of just leave the worries of the world behind for a bit, uh, which I think everyone uh, could use a little bit of right now. Um, in terms of kind of inspiration for the book, that's that's kind of a big part of it. Just my drive and my kind of desire to build something or create something for the game that I love uh, that people could also enjoy. Um, and in terms of just the focus on mystical tattoos specifically, um, there's just always, it just seems like a lot of 
fantasy media that we consume, uh, you always have these uh, these deities or these heroes, these warriors that um, kind of have these awesome, like magical tattoos, kind of uh, just all over their bodies, and they use them in very intriguing and uh, kind of creative ways. And I thought, you know, Dungeons and Dragons is all about uh, the fantastical and embracing that kind of just over the top uh the awesomeness. fantasy world yeah yeah of the fantasy world and i think the tattoos uh were a great way to kind of introduce something that um is it's kind of covered um by the by the main kind of dnd literature uh but not so much not comprehensively in my opinion um so this something that was interesting with the project was when I was conceiving of it earlier in 2020, uh, kind of drawing up the, the initial designs and the initial kind of uh, writing work behind it, um, D&D had a very limited amount of mystical tattoos, or actually no tattoos that are official to speak of. Um, and then come around November, a book called Tasha's Cauldron came out. Um, and here, D&D, Wizards of the Coast, actually, for the very first time, decided to talk a lot about or just introduce magic tattoos as they see it as they kind of wish for it to be implemented into Dungeons and Dragons so this was fantastic because I launched my campaign uh, kind of right after that um, building off this little bit of hype that they got around um, just a basic introduction to magic tattoos and it just worked out that the timing was perfect my project was already in the works and I thought you know why not just kind of ride that uh totally. ride that hype that they've created and that's where i kind of uh, landed so that's that that's awesome and man motivation. that's a really yeah. good time you had there yeah. <laughs> when it comes to um your own work you know it looks like this is your first project you've, you've created <laughs> on kickstarter have you been creating anything else in the tabletop space or is this your first go so before the kickstarter i wanted to obviously uh, get my feet wet and kind of introduce myself to the community in a different way or at least the people that I work with as well um, so I do have a I did have a patreon before I started this Kickstarter where we kind of made maps and um, magical items for Dungeons and Dragons uh, on a smaller scale because um, patreon obviously uh, it grows a little slower it's not like Kickstarter where you um, need to meet that funding goal you're just getting supporters uh, over time um, so by doing that, I was kind of able to prepare myself for the ultimate task of actually starting um, the Kickstarter. Uh, so Patreon was very helpful in building a small following um, and kind of just uh, getting into the mechanics and the writing uh, before endeavoring to take on like this bigger project. Interesting. And how did people like di discover you on Patreon? You know, d were you publishing in Facebook groups or did you have another channel or like how did people discover you there? So I'm a horrible marketer, and I'll say that up front. Uh, so really with the Hey, Patreon, you got on this show. <laughs> <laughs> my, goal, my goal with Patreon was more practice, right? I needed to, I needed, like I played Dungeons & Dragons, but there's this, this wider community that you need to connect to and connect with. So Patreon was just, um, yeah, for a lack of a better word, it was practicing my skills, creating these things, um, getting to know the community, uh, that was more so what it was. And ultimately getting the word out for that, um, it was <laughs> and people, it was a surprise to me too, but one of the biggest kind of platforms for advertising uh, a Patreon dealing with maps and items is actually Reddit. Um, there's a big community for Dungeons and Dragons on Reddit and especially for uh, what they call homebrew items, which is things that are not quite uh, from uh, Wizards of the Coast, which are official content but supplements to the game. So Reddit was uh, kind of integral in kind of slowly building that following uh, onto uh, Patreon. And from Patreon, um, that's where they kind of uh, catch a glimpse of your Twitter, your Facebook. But yeah, the main, the main medium for advertising for Patreon was definitely Reddit. And, and you're posting basically hand-drawn maps and like different assets, right, for D&D &D there? Yes, so it would, um, I think that uh, there's a degree of kind of or just people want to see something that different, something beautiful that they can uh, kind of immerse their characters in and play on. Um, so we uh, we're lucky that we have some very or a very talented um, map artist on our team 
um, that was able to kind of get that going for us. Uh, I think it's very important that you catch everyone's eye, and that goes for magical items as well that you place into the game. Uh, I mean, half the battle is getting them to stop, look at that post, and be like, oh, that looks really cool, what does it do? Because um, if they don't do that, then they're just going to scroll right by, and um, you're basically not going to get any traction on your posts at all. So, so here's a dumb question. Do you view yourself as like a an artist, a designer, a like? W how do you view yourself? <laughs> that's a tough question um, because th that's really tough because in in terms of the book um, and in terms of the Patreon, I think if I think about it right now, I'd more so consider myself a uh, a creator. Uh, in, if I needed a title, um, I do a lot of the writing, a lot of the conceptualization behind all the assets, but I think creator is the best way to place it. Um, I don't think that I want to call myself an artist. There are some incredibly talented and amazing artists on this team that, you know, deserve that kind of title a little, a little bit more. Um, uh, designers, there are also designers that I work with that have been in this kind of industry for so long, creating for Dungeons and Dragons, creating for tabletop RPGs that I'm just kind of in the, I was kind of in the shadow of that I learned from. So right now I really am just more comfortable I'm saying or like telling people, you know, I'm a creator and I'm very proud of that. And I work with very talented artists and designers and editors. Mm -hmm. um, so, so tell me a little bit about that, because looking looking in, you know, I see you creating this project. I see you know, 100K, you've raised 5,000 backers. Insane, right? What, <laughs> what's kind of happening behind the scenes with your team there? And like, how did you even find these people? So a lot of the people either. Um, so my first artist. Uh, that I work with, who was the first one who was kind of like, hey, I can do maps, um, is someone I found on a website called uh, Upwork, um, where Upwork uh, is interesting in that it kind of just allows you to just post an ad um, very easily and kind of just brings the people in. Freelancers, uh, yeah. Yeah, freelancers in. And uh, I was just very impressed with this portfolio, <laughs> to be honest with you. And after that, um, either the artist kind of saw the work and wanted to work uh, with us, or uh, they kind of just, uh, and this was interesting, when the project was posted on Kickstarter, there were kind of creators, uh, so artists, writers, uh, potential editors and designers who kind of message you on Kickstarter or through your email, which is there too, uh, asking if, uh, you know, like there was room on the project for them because they found it exciting and they felt like they could contribute something. So we're <laughs> kind of just like this uh, hodgepodge, or was it hodgepodge, uh, kind of just like this mixture of people who wanted to, uh, who just came together because they kind of believed in the project or saw their place in it. And to be honest, it's, it's, that's been quite exciting, uh, connecting with a lot of the different people who already work in this space. Got it, got it. Now, when it comes to the, the Kickstarter campaign, um, I'm sure you've seen other people who have launched projects. What was the preparation like for this? Because you're going from doing kind of like um, piece by piece, you know, month by month publishing in Patreon to now putting together a really big project with Kickstarter. Like, what did the prep look like for that? Mm. It was actually, um, it was a lot of seeing what, worked for the other creators which I which I kind of admired and followed on Kickstarter seeing what worked for them seeing which uh, connections they had to make and what kind of strategies they used um, so their prep work was first and foremost and I think quite importantly was making I think the front page of the Kickstarter as appealing as attractive as possible and this followed with uh, kind of me being like, okay, so I can make this look good. Like we have the right artists. We have a good sample because I know I can put out something good to start off with. But then something that really, really worried me was with Kickstarter, there was just this logistical aspect, you know, behind the scenes that uh, was really tricky to kind of just understand and get into as a first time uh, campaign starter. Um, so actually something that was really helpful with that, Sal, was your videos. Um, and a lot of Awesome, like, man. I didn't know you watched my videos. <laughs> of course I did. Uh, you have a lot of content there that's really helpful, especially for first-time creators. Um, so yeah, your videos were actually very helpful. Um, there was a particular one you had 
that was actually like one of the videos where after I watched it, I was like, okay, fine, I can start now. Uh, you posted something on, um, what was it? So, uh, I've done, all, I've done a few stuff on, on tabletops. I know. Um, it wasn't on tabletop. It was figuring out whether or what type of payment option you want to give your, um, your backers. And that was, <laughs> that was really stressing me out. And I watched your video and you, you kind of laid out that there's like three different ways to do this. Um, and you gave the pros and cons of each. And oh, I was able for to shipping just, maybe. Yeah, yeah. And I was able to write that down, kind of figure out the options and like compare that with what the other tabletop creators were doing. And I was like, damn, this was so helpful. And after, I think the day after I was like, okay, let's launch. Um, so that was very helpful. That's and great. I'm so you. happy to hear that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome, man. Um, so it sounds like you basically looked at other projects. You did a little bit of your own homework, you know, researched online, and that kind of informed a lot of putting together the campaign, right? 100%, yeah. Now, I don't mean to, like, um, you know, say that you have small numbers here, but, like, okay, so on your Patreon, right, you got, like, 140 patrons, which is which is super good. I mean, that's, that's really good. I think that's very high quality. But then on your Kickstarter, you got, like, 5,000 people, right? How, where did that where did that jump come from like you go you hit the launch button like walk me through this you hit launch what what yeah. happens from that that first week okay i think it's good to kind of preface this by saying that my initial funding goal was three thousand dollars um that's canadian and i mean i i thought that was you know that was fair for what i was trying to do here um and the the initial goal and the initial stretch goals kind of reflected that um, and that was due to what you just said, the Patreon, my Patreon follower count and the social media follower count that I had was not very high. That's because we just started, um, I think March of 2020 or even I think later, um, on Patreon and those social media platforms. Um, so what happened after hitting launch was, uh, just this, and I, I kept track of the stats and this is so at the start it was mostly friends so a lot of suggestions is getting the friends in um, getting the family in to, to support but most of them were just kind of backing at like two dollars one dollar or like you know because they don't know about Dungeons and Dragons that much mm -hmm. um, but over the next few days something so very interesting happened was um, so much traffic just this ridiculous amount of traffic coming from Kickstarter itself so on your dashboard, you're able to see where all these people are coming from. And I could just see discovery, um, like a game section. Um, like you just see they're coming in from Kickstarter's website. And if you follow the campaign's progress on KickTrack, you can see that this contributed to that slow kind of ramping uh, amount of backers. And it was just kind of surprising. And we surpassed that 3,000 goal, like I think within, a, I don't know, 48 hours or uh, I forgot the number, but it was really fast. And from that point on, um, I started a bit of uh, Facebook ads. So again, I'm, I'm really new to kind of having that platform to begin with. But so I started the Facebook ads and that kind of kept that steady stream going, but it was still Kickstarter that was kind of creating this influx of backers that I just didn't see coming. Um, and a great, uh, a great deal of those backers, when they message you, they tell you, you know, we're following your project because we think it's, uh, it's it's new, it's unique, um, and we've always wanted to see this. And you know, we've seen Tasha's. Let's see what your tattoos can do. So it was kind of awesome to see that, on top of the, uh, on top of what I thought was kind of an interesting idea, a lot of these people actually also agreed and found that this was something they'd love to see in their games, and that was creating the momentum. So uh, it seems like uh, Kickstarter, <laughs> on its own, is already kind of a great way or just it's just this great platform that allows people to see your project uh if if it's already rolling which is were, awesome were you surprised about that at all yes 100 percent. it's not like so patreon does not do that patreon does not have this like discovery page or like uh uh you know a section for different creators which you know you know maybe they should um and it's it's like it's like i'm doing the minimal, the most minimum, I think, amount of work I could possibly do for marketing and advertising because I'm just not experienced in that department. I wanted to focus on the product, and it's the Kickstarter is still allowing me to do that. 
um, and it kept uh, and it kept bringing in these backers at a, a ridiculous rate. Um, now there is a point in the campaign about a week or two weeks. Well, well before, before we before we get into that, um, can I can we just like dive into just that tiny bit a little bit more? So you talked about like the need, not necessarily. You know, a lot of people are like, you do have to have an, an audience, and you should obviously have a little bit of one. But you were able to connect with strangers, right, on Kickstarter who were supporting you. Um, were they like, and they were leaving comments? Like, what did that feel like? Because you're getting tremendous validation, like for the first time on on your work there. Are you looking for help with the fulfillment side of your rewards on Kickstarter, Indiegogo, or any other crowdfunding website? Fulfillrite is literally the gold standard when it comes to crowdfunding reward fulfillment. These guys will help you ship out your products, your packages, your orders to all of your customers and your backers. They've been working in this industry for a really long time. I totally vouch for their services and they'll even do things like answer simple questions for you on fulfillment and shipping and figuring out how to get your products into the hands of your customers in the easiest way possible. If you're interested in learning more about them, you can go to fulfillright.com or crowdcrux.com slash fulfillright, and that will take you to them. Again, that is F-U-L-F-I-L-L-R-I-T-E.com. Yeah, so um, I, I did read a couple of articles before starting on the importance of you know creating an email list uh, building a following on your social media. Um, but uh, I just, I couldn't bring myself to to kind of put a halt on what I wanted to to kind of create here just because I hadn't reached this threshold of like 1,000 email followers or, I mean, 1,000 people on your email list or um, kind of uh, 10,000 followers on social media that you could kind of advertise this project to beforehand. Um, so yeah, you know, I was... I was definitely surprised, but I didn't want to let that deter me from starting the project. And when the comments started coming in, um, I thought that what was helpful with that was people were willing to spread the word for you and people were willing to kind of hop onto the project as long as when you they did actually comment on your project, when they did message you, and there were a lot of messages, um, you kind of answered what they wanted answered and you responded promptly um, it, it just seemed like they were more, they were more willing to go the extra mile to kind of see your project succeed, whether that was in terms of finally actually backing themselves, uh, backing to a higher level, sharing the project. Um, it was very validating, um, but it was also very surprising for sure. Um, just having, uh, I'm going to say this, like a lot of follow, a lot of people who start projects have a big following. Um, so starting with what I would call a minuscule following. Um, and seeing them kind of just come in, in in droves was very, very surprising. And yeah, very. Yeah. And, and people were also supporting it at big numbers. Like you have people who are supporting at the hundred dollar tier, right? You have people at the forty five dollar. Um, yeah. I think a lot of beginning, you know, entrepreneurs or creative types, uh, when they're just launching, they think most people are going to be at the eighteen dollar, the twenty five. Right. But you had ones at higher tiers, too. Yeah. Um, something. <laughs> So what I was going to kind of lead into was that uh, I joined up with Backerkit towards the last week. Um, so something that uh, a lot of people were kind of messaging about was um, offers to help with, with marketing it out. And one of the comments was that, you know, you, you could have, Carl, you could have raised the dollar amounts on, on these tiers uh, if you had decided instead to... Uh, kind of ship this yourself or, you know, find a fulfillment company and find a printer as opposed to going with print on demand. Um, and I kind of just crunched the numbers towards the end of the campaign in terms of like, if, if I did do that myself with 5,000 backers, it would have been, um, it would have been kind of a ridiculous kind of dollar amount there to end with. Um, so one thing that I am kind of uh, considering for the next campaign is is trying to find a way to uh, to handle all that logistical stuff the the after the post fulfillment or the fulfillment of the project uh, in a more kind of uh, in a more organized way where I talk to the distributors beforehand figure out the logistics and and get it done that way yeah well um, said 
Um, yeah. One of the other points it looks like you had as a, as a takeaway was the engagement of the community. So like you're already familiar with Reddit, right? You're already familiar with Patreon. How did you engage and keep the community engaged throughout the campaign? Um, I, I thought I just, I kind of just used the tools that Kickstarter provided. I, I did look on a few campaigns after I ended and uh, I have 26 updates in total. One private. That's a lot. Um, yeah. Yeah. So um, what I was uh, interested in testing out for my first run was uh, <laughs> keeping the backers constantly updated. Um, and in my opinion, I think that would be annoying to a lot of people. Maybe even me, if I backed a project, if I was like minorly engaged with it and like minorly interested. Uh, but for the most part, there was no kind of pushback on kind of getting these almost daily or like uh, like every two days updates because people felt like they were always involved, like they were always kind of being or kind of able to keep track of the project. So this is my, my community engagement. A big part of it was making sure that all comments on the comment page was answered and uh, constant updates to so that they know what's going on behind the scenes. And honestly, there was never any like, uh, Carl, please, please stop sending us emails or Carl, just you know, slow down. We know what's going on. No, it was more so like, you know, thank you for uh, thank you for keeping us in the loop. Thank you for gathering our feedback. And surprisingly, a lot of the uh, community did contribute a lot of ideas that now are actually going to be in the book. And I think they love they, they love the feeling of being uh, part of the book, which is they are, which they are. That's there was very a community cool. poll as well. So yeah. Did, did you also have like an email list or anything like that? Um, we started an email list afterwards, actually. Um, so no, I, I would say that uh, before the project started, there was no, there was no email list. There was no one to email. Um, so yeah, the That's email list is something we started during the project, and we now, um, we now have. Uh, a number of people on it so that's see, okay. see what i love about that is like that goes against a lot of the practices that i say like you should build the email list beforehand but it just goes to show that you don't necessarily always have to like it's really the most important thing is the product right at yes, the end of the day yes I, I i strongly believe that you know there was a lot of people who who came to me who, who kind of asked you know what, what what worked for you with marketing and advertising and I don't really know any other way to phrase it than, you know, like if you're, <laughs> if you believe in your project and if you think your project is, is unique and something that the community would really like, I mean, they'll, they'll come, I guarantee you, they will come. It's not like, it's not like Kickstarter hides your project under a rock, which maybe some people believe that it does. It, um, if your, if your project is, is good, if your project is something people want in their game, especially in the in case of this, which is a Dungeons and Dragons supplement. I do believe that people will come because uh, even on top of the advanced discovery page, um, when people pledge to a project, when people message you, which is interesting, when you get an email update, Kickstarter actually lists a lot of recommended projects underneath um, and they will include projects that are related to it. So if you're in something like like D&D or tabletop RPGs, um, you know, your, your project is going to be shown. So if people like what they see, they'll go to your project. And I don't know, that's that's kind of my only tip is, you know, create something that you really believe in. If you believe in it and if you think that it's exciting, why not? Other people might find it exciting as well. Um, yeah, yeah, definitely. Do you have any advice on the, um, the structuring of the rewards here or the way that you went about that? Because I think that gives people a lot of headache. It's like, I don't want to make it too complicated. I want to make it exciting. How are you thinking about the rewards? 100%. Um, my rewards were actually born of, again, the research I did from other campaigns, but, uh, so something interesting here is the thrifty, um, thrifty tier, which is an $18, uh, tier. And then the right, the one right after it is the PDF, which is the exact same thing for $25. And if you look at it, it's, uh, 1,500 for 18 and 1,000 for 25, but it's the exact same product. Um, so what I, what I did there was kind of, you know, like if people, I think people need to understand that, uh, the biggest thing for a creator is making sure that their project, uh, is given the chance to succeed and is given the chance to be funded. Um, it's not to kind of just take or get as much money as possible. Right. So I think one strategy I employed there is, is kind of making this tier and showing people that it's okay to 
you know, it's okay to pledge less, you can still get the same product. We're only interested in making sure that this project succeeds and everyone can get something that they want. Um, for the rest of the tiers, uh, I structured it in a way where like, there was still a potential. So there's, there's a hardcover copy, which is kind of the main thing that people want to back uh, at 30, uh, 30 or higher. So the, the tricky part was figuring out how to create a tier where uh, you still get benefits, um, but it's not too complicated. So the $100 tier um, just gives you uh, the shipping. So I ship directly from myself. And there's a signature included with it, and you get early release content, which is cool. But the highest tier is $130, where people were allowed to actually create their own tattoo to put in the book. So uh, it, you just kind of have to get creative. And I think that's a very simple way to get people kind of excited and wanting to kind of go into the higher tiers is giving them kind of input into the product, which actually shows up in the product. Um, I don't recommend it for every project, obviously, but um, it really, I was kind of confident that the higher tiers would be taken up, especially if people like want to see something that they create as well, which I think that they do. Now, there are different um, schools of thought. I love to use that word, schools of thought, right? There are different schools of thought when it comes to things like stretch goals. So some people hate them, oh. like this is stupid, <laughs> right? Other people love them. They're like, this is such a great idea. Where do you kind of fall on that spectrum? <laughs> I made a mistake with stretch goals. <laughs> um, so, I, oh man, if you look at the first uh, 14 stretch goals, they go from uh, they go from five thousand dollars to twenty five thousand um, dollars, and there were 14 of them, which were it's not it's not an easy task. Uh, each of these stretch goals require much more work and much more time put into the project. I stand on um, now. If you make a Kickstarter, um, limit your stretch goals at first. Uh, something you're not going to be aware of initially is how much interest you're going to get. And uh, I think that packing all of my stretch goals in there um, kind of made it so we blew past all of them. And now there's this there's a ton of work that needs to be completed, which is great. But uh, I wish I had spaced them out a little bit more in terms of having them versus not having them all together. I think that stretch goals ultimately get your backers excited. Um, and there's like very little things that can get them excited um, after already knowing what you want to provide in the book. So I feel like for all my future projects, there has to be stretch goals. And I've seen stretch goal, I've seen projects with none. Um, and I can see that they have this great kind of like uh, this great roadmap already for what they want to do. But as a backer, uh, personally, I, I would be pretty I would be much more invested in a project if I saw you know like if if we get to this point there's we, we get more stuff like we get um, this amazing new uh, addition to to your book or to your to your board game uh, I want to see that like as a backer I want to see that and as a creator I strongly strongly recommend um, giving the option to to reach a stretch goal yeah yeah definitely so as you know if you if you watch my YouTube yeah, I'm a little bit crazy. Like I want to um, <laughs> explain things to a T and I like getting really detailed. What do you feel like is not well explained when it comes to either the Kickstarter dashboard or the whole process? Hmm. Um, I think I think you do a good job of explaining a lot of the, the elements of Kickstarter and a lot of uh, creators on YouTube do as well. Uh, but yes, yeah, so definitely that video I mentioned earlier. So things regarding Kickstarter's um, fulfillment process. Mm. And I think that this is due to, and this is something I noticed as a first time creator, even Kickstarter's fulfillment options right now is in beta. Like it's, that just tells you something. Like it's, it's, not, it's not fleshed out completely yet. There's, uh, there's not a lot of um, kind of reliable information out there yet on uh, creating these tiers, uh, kind of grabbing all that information from your backers, finding a way to produce their product and shipping them. Like some people, some creators might be like, when do I do this? Do I do this during the project? Do I do this afterwards? Um, it's, 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 a, it's something about Kickstarter that's going to be very intimidating for new creators, and I knew it was for me. Um, I, I really needed to kind of dive into your videos on that post on that post project portion yeah, of the campaign yeah. 
Um, so yeah, I'm very grateful for you to provide that. And I, I really hope for more of that kind of content from you and other creators uh, regarding Kickstarter's fulfillment process. I do think there's a lot that, um, I mean, I, I love obviously the platform and um, there's a lot that kind of goes unexplained. Like even now the beta program with having add-ons you can now have on Kickstarter, right? <laughs> um, not a lot of people even know about that or having time-related rewards, right? Not See, that's, that's not really yeah, covered too much. It's not. And I think uh, for me, when I saw those things and even the, the beta fulfillment uh, reward surveys that they're allowing you to give now, um, I, I just kind of glossed over it. So if it wasn't if it wasn't something that I was aware of because of reading articles or watching videos or listening to other creators, um, I kind of was just like, okay, I don't want to I don't want to try something that's going to like take a lot of my time and maybe won't work out yet. So for Kickstarter, yeah, I think and honestly, I think it, yeah, it does fall on people like myself to kind of preframe and what's worth your time, what's not, basically. Exactly, yeah. So um, you, you are a, you're a big source of information in that sense. Um, and actually, <laughs> because of what I said, like I didn't I didn't touch it because you didn't talk about. It. I was like, okay, well, <laughs> then, yeah, <laughs> that's hilarious. That's okay. Yeah, I got to do a better <laughs> job then. Okay. Um, one of the other things I wanted to get a sense of is like, you know, you've now been able to tap into something where. This is gonna. This is like setting the foundation, basically, for the future, right? And now you have a micro community and people that are not just following you, but also bought your product. They're customers, right? Yes, yes. Where do you think this plays in, in your story? Like, is this going to be the start of a whole business? Is it going to be just something you do for fun? Um, where do you see this going here? Um, at first, it was something I was going to do on the side because I am. I am a librarian. Uh, full time and I love my job. That is um, awesome, man. Can you sneak yeah. in my books into the libraries there? <laughs> uh, it's good to hear a library enthusiast there. Um, <laughs> but I think that it, it's hard when you when you when you have a project that has become successful to just say, you know, no, this was a one time thing. I'm never doing this again. It, it actually is the other way. So w once you experience this kind of success, uh, for me, I feel like I want to kind of continue creating um, because not only does it yeah you have that community but now you also have a bit of that funding that you can kind of take and put into the next project which I think is the the smart thing to do is kind of invest in uh, other ideas that you have that the community might be interested in um, and I think that just the amount of enjoyment if you enjoyed it right there's stress but if you enjoyed it I think that you should keep doing it and that's what it is for me so I want to keep yeah. doing this I want to build this to me, from, from the outside in, the, the major learning lesson as well, um, aside from you know having a really good product market fit and um, kind of getting the validation here, is you've been able to also master another skill, which plagues a lot of creators, in my opinion, which is the ability to build a team and to have a success <laughs> come from a team effort, right? Yes. Um, so I think that when when you approach people to help you on your project um, or they come to you in my case it was because of the Kickstarter because of the Kickstarter I was more comfortable asking for help uh, and people were more comfortable lending their help uh, so yeah building a team in that way uh, is something I think is it, it's it's scary uh, it's scary for a lot of people if you like you're worried about whether people will, will want to sign on um, but this is something I gained experience in. You're right. Uh, in doing my first Kickstarter was being able to bring people into the idea, into the into the concept, and where and telling them where they fit, and then they're like, "Awesome!" Uh, that's that's something that I can bring into my other projects, and it's a skill I did not have before. Uh, it's something I value now. Have Have you told anyone in your personal life, like your family or anything, about this success you've had here? Um, yeah, <laughs> because. So one of the main tips at the start of your campaign that everyone says is tell your friends and family first. So they were there when I was at zero dollars or three dollars. <laughs> they must the have been end. super, super surprised about that. Yeah. <laughs> so when the friends and family checked in on the, on the very last day in the product uh, project and they're like, Carl, what is this amount here? It says, uh, <laughs> says 130,000. Uh, what happened? Yeah, so it, definitely a lot of family members and a lot of friends are um, very supportive and very happy at where the project landed. 
and surprisingly a lot of them have picked up Dungeons and Dragons and kind of like what's going on why is this so popular uh, what did Carl do <laughs> yeah yeah that that's so awesome well uh, congratulations on, on everything and the, the way that it's going where can people go to learn a bit more about some of the stuff you got in the future here um uh, just go to natones.com so n-a-t-w-n uh, w-u-n-s dot com um, from there you can hit up all of our social media and patreon and from like sign up to our newsletter from there like you can pick up on all of our project updates and you know uh, hopefully it's an easy uh, website to go to um, other than that uh, I hope that you know people just find me on Kickstarter or find what the team does on Kickstarter uh, yeah that's awesome it. so so my final question to you to kind of um, leave things on this note is if you were you're going back in time you know you're talking to yourself you're at the library and you're like hey dude um you're gonna have a really wild adventure in front of you for the next 30 days what's one thing you would tell yourself hmm that's an interesting question <laughs> uh give me one second it could be I... um it could be a word of inspiration it could be um, a tip, it could be something that you wish you had known going into it, anything along on those lines. Oh, yeah. Uh, believe in yourself. <laughs> it's easy. It's easy in that first, uh, that first day before you start and like the 24 hours after you've launched um, to just be like, oh my, God. <laughs> am I serious about this? Like, this is going to be so embarrassing if it fails. Am I crazy? Um, yeah. Yeah, uh, just believe in yourself, believe in your idea. You've, you've gotten to the point where you think that this is a good enough idea to put on Kickstarter, that that's, that's already a step. Uh, follow through. Just believe in yourself uh, and just keep going. Um, well said. Thank you so much, man, for, for coming on the show, being a supporter of the channel, and good luck with yeah. your success. Uh, thank you so much. And you also, man, uh, keep doing what you're doing. Um, and I can tell you firsthand, uh, you're helping a lot of creators. Uh, so, yeah. Thank Keep you very much. <laughs> Thank you for listening to this episode of the Crowdfunding Demystified Podcast. Hey, my name is Salvador Brigman, if you don't know. And um, I've do, been doing this podcast since 2015, so we got a lot of great stuff in the archives of the show. But I also do a YouTube channel under my same name, Salvador Brigman. Just search it. Um, I also got an Instagram where I put up bite-sized content. I got a book called The Kickstarter Launch Formula available on Audible. If you like me, the way that I read things with passion and pizzazz, right? Um, with some gumption, you might like my Kickstarter Launch Formula book. It really documents all of my findings and more um, when it comes to Kickstarter and how to launch a successful project. You can check that out at crowdcrux.com slash kickstarter audio. That is C-R-O-W-D-C-R-U-X.com slash kickstarter audio. Crowdcrux.com slash kickstarter audio. Got a ton of great stuff coming about this year. Um, I have a lot of new projects that I'm going to be working on that you're going to be seeing soon some cool stuff when it comes to like a rebrand of my site, new products that I'm coming out with, um, my coaching program, like tons of cool stuff. I'm, I'm really excited for, for some of the stuff that's um, going to be underway. So make sure you subscribe to the podcast so you get some of those updates and follow me on my, my, uh, my newsletter, etc. But I did mention, if you want to book a one-on-one -on -one coaching call with me, I am getting really booked up, right? So um, there are a lot of people who, you know, have new projects that they're launching. I'm getting really booked up. I do have a little bit of leeway if you can email me ahead of time um, if you want to do like an earlier one. But for now, um, if you're interested in booking a one-on-one -on -one coaching call with me going intensive into your project, um, this is really for you if you just want an expert basically to tell you as it is um, to not only lay out a blueprint and a strategy to give you all the checklist things that you need to do going into a Kickstarter campaign, but also for me to assess your specific product, your category, um, the different agencies in the industry, the different tools that are out there, whether or not you want to work with me or someone else. Um, I'm very non-biased in that way. Uh, I only want to work with people that I believe in their products. And that's like a very small percentage of, of the, the people that I'm introduced to, right? So usually for me, I try to make these 
uh, an intensive one-off coaching session. You know, I don't assume that you're going to enroll in a, a longer term coaching program. I don't assume you're interested in, you know, hiring me for, for something or um, to help you promote your project or anything like that. Um, this is really a one-off coaching session that's designed to make you feel confident, to make you feel good going into your next campaign, to be armed with a war chest of tools to help you out. And not only that, it's like, it's the same thing if, you know, if you have a business, you need to hire an accountant. You know, if you are trying to do something like set up a corporation, maybe you need to hire a lawyer really to know your stuff, right? In any kind of area, you go and you, to the experts and you hire them because it, it helps you do it faster, right? If you're trying to diagnose yourself, you can't just do it yourself. You're going WebMD and you think like, oh, I have all of these different diseases. Instead, you go to a doctor, you know, you go to someone who can help you out. And that's what I've been trying to provide in this industry is first of all, I started with the free content, the podcast, the book, the blog, um, my YouTube channel, all that stuff is free. But if you want to go a layer deeper and you really want a trained expert to assess your project, you can go to crowdcrux.com slash coaching. That is C-R-O-W-D-C-R-U-X.com slash coaching, crowdcrux.com slash coaching. I've been doing this for eight years. and I'd be more than willing to bring my expertise and my experience to your project. Hope you enjoy it. Thank you for listening and I'll see you next time.